didn't cut you off. Great right? breath. Got you to stand up. And I uh, was my bad. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for Rachel not being mad at me because I cut her off. Thank you for your presence with us. Please, now, we want to learn from you. And we've been learning from you in the testimonies. We saw what you can do in our lives. And it's amazing when we can, we can so sometimes we forget because of the routine. And we come here every Sunday and we, we talk to the, to the same people, to similar people. And then we just forget how wonderful you are in our lives sometimes. Thank you for remind, reminding us of that. So please talk to us, teach us, and help us understand your love and grace so we can become what you called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, we've been for these last two, two weeks talking about the church in Corinth and how God has been teaching them how to be a church. Uh, for the first week, we discussed the idea of fellowship, koinonia, what they share that is fundamental for them, for them, which is Jesus. And last week we started talking about holiness. And it's interesting because today we are celebrating Pentecost. The word Pentecost in Greek means literally 50th. Man, the ordinary number for number 50, 50th. Uh, it's because for 49 days after the people of God left Egypt, you can see the story there in Exodus, so after they left Egypt, for 49 days, they were preparing to receive the word of God, the law. The, 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 the word in Hebrew for law, Torah, you can translate as the way. So, for 49 days, that's what we call, that's why they called the festival or the feast of the weeks. Because for 49 days, which equals many weeks, it, Pauline, thank you. Se six weeks? Six or seven? Seven weeks? They were. Th pa Pauline, thank you. Now, because I'm. Ha house, numbers, I look for Pauline, but that's. Pauline is here. That's a perfect place for you to be. Pauline, never leave. So, for, for seven weeks, they would wait and prepare to receive the law of God. And it's interesting because when you talk about Pentecost and you talk about the law of God, see, in the Old Testament, when they received the law, they didn't have books. Actually, books like that, like with cover, we only get that. 500 years after Jesus is here. So only the 5th century, we're going to have books like that. They have the scrolls, scrolls like that. So in a scroll, if you get the law, and the law with Torah, way, law, we're referring to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. That's how, that's what they believed was the law, the way, so they could know God. Once again, they left Egypt. Now the question is, who are we? Who, how, how, how are we going to relate to God? How are we going to relate to each other? The question is, God's going to give you a way, way, law, the same word in Hebrew, Torah, God's going to give you a way. And if you ask, okay, but what's the goal of the law? And if you take a scroll, if you take the law in a scroll, and if you open a scroll, you open the middle. I mean, if you are organized enough to put a right thing here. But you don't start from the, from the, the bottom or the top. You start from the middle. And if you open the middle, the first thing you see when you open the law, the first verse you see when you open the law of God is Leviticus 19.2. Can you get me Beth Leviticus 19.2, please? You speak, again, first thing, you take the law and you open, Ashley's not here anymore, she's not going to be mad at me. You open, the first thing you see, Leviticus 19, 2, 19.2, speak to the entire assembly of Israel. Say to them, be holy. Opa. Hmm. So the first thing that you read in the law of God when you open, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And the word holy in Hebrew, kadosh, well, the, the Greek word hagios, Go, it appears over 300 times in the Word of God. It's a word that's there a lot. And this word literally is hagios, literally means separated, different. So the idea is, you are going to be different. You are going to be unique. You are going to be special. But for you to be unique and for you to be special, the same way Lord, your God, is unique, is special, is something else you need to follow the law. So in the minds, <clears throat> I need coffee because my voice is breaking here. <clears throat> 
By the way, my friend from Manitoba, I forgot your name. Greg. Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. I feel, I feel loved. I feel loved. Greg, have you tried our coffee yet? Yes. Okay, good. Did you like it? Okay. Ah, come on, Greg. <laughs> Somebody's not, not welcome here anymore, huh? It's much better than Tim Hortons. Uh, uh, Neil, make sure you get his face online so people know <laughs> what absurd you just heard here in this church. We have the best coffee in Ontario. Done. Anyways, uh, be holy. So, they already understood. We are going to have this law. If, no, no, it's important. I'm talking about Jewish people, Old Testament. If I follow this law, I will be separated. I will be special. So, what's the idea here for the Jewish people? If I do this, if I follow this way, I am holy, I am separated, I am special, I am unique. So see, the question is, what makes me special if I follow the law, following the law? So in the minds of the Jewish people here, be holy is a consequence of following the law. I'm talking about Jewish people here, okay, Old Testament. So the whole theology, the whole understanding of the people of Israel is, if we follow the law, we will be... Uh, Deb Small, how, how is Randy? It's fine. What does he... He's there, he's here already? He's in the hospital, but he's fine. Is he playing pickleball already? Not yet. When can we expect him to be back here with us? A few days. Excellent. We miss him. Okay, so the consequence of following the law is to be holy. So being separated is a consequence when you follow the law of God. Okay, okay, okay. That's the Old Testament idea. But then something happens with Jesus. And when we look at Pentecost, once again, Pentecost was the celebration that the law, the way was received by the people. God gave to Moses Mount Sinai. Uh, he gave the law. So they received the law. They're celebrating that. They celebrate Pentecost, 50th day, 50th. The 50th day after the Passover, we are celebrating this. But in the New Testament, we're going to get a new idea for Pentecost. Beth, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, please. When the day of Pentecost, once again, minds of Jewish people here, the day they celebrate the law, what makes them holy? The law. So why do I follow the law? To be holy. To be holy is a consequence of following the law, following those ways. So I, if I do everything right, as a consequence, I'm holy. Okay, so now, see. When the day of Pentecost, that's Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and, come, and came to the rest on each of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. Okay, so now something's changed here with Jesus. The way we understand is that we are not made holy, see, because we follow the law. We follow the law. We have a moral code. We act properly. We, say, we talk in a way. We think in a way. But the difference is, I don't do that to be holy. I do that because I'm holy. So holiness, separation, uniqueness, it's not something you achieve with your strength. It's something that you are because of Jesus Christ. The moment that you believe that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, and He loves you, and you devote your life for Him, you receive God, now you have a connection with God, with the Holy Spirit, you are holy. That changes everything. Because now, I'm not giving you a way for you to be holy. I'm giving you a way because first comes your holiness. The Holy Spirit makes you holy. And this is going to be this idea, and now let's go to Cor the ch church in Corinth here. It's going to be very important to the church in Corinth. But give me 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 11, please. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we, have to, we have to, yeah. We have to. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. <laughs> well, no, just let it blow. 
this is water. Actually, it is water. Coffee, I mean, coffee is water, right? Anyways, it's coffee. I'm not lying. I'm, I'm joking, just by the way. Okay. And that is what some of you were. I'm going to go back to this verse in a minute. I want to focus on the rest of the verse. But you were washed. You were sanctified. Sanctify is the verb hagioze, to make holy. So you were made holy. You were justified by the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of your God. So holiness in Christianity is not something you achieve by your own strength. It's a state. It's something that you are because of grace of Jesus Christ. That, of course, does not mean that the law is not important. But it's different now. Because you learn to live in a way because you are made holy by the Holy Spirit that lives in you. Not like... The Jewish people believed that they had to achieve with their own strength. It's the power of God working in your life. So now, we're talking about a church here, the church in Corinth, that we discussed a couple weeks ago. They were a different church. They didn't have this foundation of the Jewish law, like the Roman church or the church in Jerusalem. They had this knowledge. They didn't. So the idea is how are we going to be holy? How can we truly be holy if we don't have the same thing that the other churches have? We don't have the Word of God. We, we're not born in a Christian house or in a Jewish house. The answer is no, no, no. You are made holy by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus. You believed in Jesus, now you're holy. But now you're going to learn how to live a holy life. That's why Paul He's going to spend a long time in the letter to the Corinthians, teaching, teaching them the meaning of being holy. It's interesting because when Paul writes to the Romans, for example, he doesn't have to go all through this, not trouble, all through this moment, all through this need of teaching them how to live a holy life. What Paul did in Romans is changing their mind. No, no, no. Oh, you are not holy because of the law. You follow the law because... You are holy in Jesus Christ. So they had this foundation. In Corinth, the Corinthians don't. So Paul has to teach them to follow what is the law. That's why starting verse uh, in chapter 5, Paul is going to teach them the meaning of now that you are holy, that you are holy. What does it mean to walk and to live a holy life? C get, get me uh, chapter 6, verse 9, Beth. Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Oh. Aha, you weren't expecting this one, huh? <laughs> I got you. This one wasn't in the script, I know. Or do not know the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor uh, men who have sex with men. Go, move for me. Verse 10. Let's go to verse 11 again afterwards. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then, okay, go back to verse 11. Or continue to verse 11. Just to complete what you said. And that some of you were. But now you're washed. And now you're sanctified because of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you have to change your life. The change that happens in your life is a consequence of the Holy Spirit acting in your heart. That's why we're doing here with the baptism is so important. The girls, they're not saying, no, no, I'm, do, I'm being baptized because now I'm perfect. I have no more mistakes in my life. No, they're saying, no, no, I understand that I want to live a holy life. And it's the process. It's not the end, Baptist. It's the beginning of this walk with the Lord. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's a process. But it's the beginning. So when you come here and say, guys, my testimony, Jesus changed me, and I'm telling you, I'm going to walk a specific, different life. And the baptism shows, this example is the testimony, the public testimony of this commitment to walk on a different life. And then Paul going to have to tell them what it means to be holy. And it's interesting because some things look obvious. For example, give me chapter 5, verse 1. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 1, for example, Paul is going to start discussing with them the meaning now of living a holy life. And look at that. It is reported that there is sexual immorality among you. It's a church, already in the church, and of kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. See there, 
His mother, or, not my, or stepmother, I don't, I don't know, but that's a problem here. It, isn't it obvious? Like, really, Paul has to tell these kids, guys, you, can, you cannot sleep with your stepmother, really? Like, isn't that obvious? Paul is talking to a people here that is not about, okay, okay, let me go back one moment, one moment to hear. We, so two weeks ago, we discussed how the church in Corinth was different. They didn't have the Jewish foundation. They were very poor. So they didn't have, we saw how Paul compliments them, right? You are not beautiful, you are not intelligent, you are not wise, but God, you know, so don't use that with your spouse anyways. But anyways, so, but now, not only that, the place they live, the city, the city of Corinth was a very complicated city. See, the city of Corinth was uh, in, the, in the Greek empire until 150 before Christ, because the city was destroyed in 145 before Christ, and rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 49, 39 uh, before Christ. So, until the second century before Christ, so far, 500, 600 years, Corinth was one of the main cities for the, for the trade in the Greek Empire. It connected the east and the west, north and south. So it was a very important city to connect everything, and it had a very famous harbor, it was a port city. And in any ancient uh, society, civilization, port city, when there is a port city, it means there is a lot of prostitution. Because a lot of people go and come in all the time. So if you, if you look at the, at the ancient place famous for prostitution, they are famous for, for being a port city. Amsterdam, in Netherlands, Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. I'm not saying that is a good thing. No, I'm just saying that happens. So Corinth, so they are famous for being uh, port cities. A lot of ships coming, the main form of exchange of trades, it's ship, and they are formal for, being, uh, for having a lot of prostitution. And in Corinth, they had two main temples for different Greek gods. One of the temples in the, Cor in the city of Corinth was a temple for Aphrodite. And Aphrodite is the goddess, uh, the Greek goddess of passion, or of beauty, and a way to worship this goddess was through sex. So the priests, they would offer sex as a form of worship to the goddess. And that's interesting, because at the same time, there was another temple in the ancient Corinth, the temple of As Asclepius. Asclepius. Asclepius is the son of Apollo, that's not a point now, but he's the god of medicine. If you see the, the symbol or the token of medicine, which is a staff, with a winged uh, serpent. That's the staff of Asclepius. So Asclepius, he is the god of medicine. But what's the point here? When the anthropologists start taking a look at uh, Corinth, they found out that one way to worship Asclepius is that you would make a statue or a sculpture of the part of your body you want to be healed. So, for example, you would make a sculpture of your arm and you take to the temple of Asclepius. You would give your body, or your, your, your old uh, arm, but not the arm, the sculpture of your arm, to the God, and you would receive healing in exchange. And it's interesting because they found that three in every four sculptures in Corinth was made of genitals. Because the city was famous for having a lot of sexual disease. So imagine that. You are in a city marked by sexual immorality. That's why verse, uh, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, the first letter to the Corinthians. Paul is going to talk so much about that. It's present in the city. And imagine that you are a slave. You came to Christ now. But you are still a slave. So probably if your owner, he serves or he wants to do this sexual parties as a worship, you have to work because you are a slave. You have no choice. So how, how can now a church in a place like that, we are poor, we are slaves, how can we in fact, now I'm holy, but I live in this society marked by darkness, as Carla here said today, how can I be holy, how can my state of holiness, how can I live a holy life when everything around me is marked by darkness? And that's why Paul's going to teach them that you not only have to live your personal life like that, but the church is a place to live in a holy way too. For example, if you see, you don't have to go there, Beth. If you see chapter 6, verse, no, okay, let's go there. Chapter 6, verse 1. Last one, Carmen, I promise you. 
I need to save some for the afternoon too. I don't want to make coffee in my house today. I prefer this one because in our church, our coffee is much better than Tim Hortons. Anyway, so if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? That seems like, okay, but think with me here. We're talking about a church, a lot of slaves, a lot of people with no civil rights. They had no value for society. They were poor. They were slaves. Some of them in the church were owners of slaves, were rich. But not many, as Paul says in chapter 1, verse 26. Not many had money. Not many had wisdom. But so most of the church made by slaves. And the question is, it's obvious that if you are a slave, and then, uh, okay, now let me give a better example. I am a slave here. My mother-in-law owns me. She kind of does, but that's not the point right now. She, because if I say my wife, it's clear as day that she owns me. But, she, okay, my mother-in-law owns me. And I'm a slave. She's a slave owner. So if she brings, so if we have a problem in our relationship, and if she takes to any judge to judge, it doesn't matter. He won't listen to me. I'm a slave. So she'll be right in the eyes of the judge. She has social status. I don't. So if you take our problems outside of the church, your status will speak louder than the actual problem. If you are rich, and if you take to a judge, he won't listen to me, I'm poor, I'm a slave. So Paul says, no, 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 no. Outside they live like that, but here we're going to live a holy life. And the first point of a holy life is that it doesn't matter your social status, doesn't matter your last name, doesn't matter how much money you have, you are all equal before God. So everything, you have a problem with your brother, here is going to be the place you're going to solve this problem. Forget about outside, because if you sue your brother and sister outside, your status is going to speak louder. The action doesn't really matter. What matters is how important you are, how much money you have, but not here. So here, we're going to live a life as such, they're going to create a new place. Here, we are holy. So here we solve our problems here because outside we are different, not here. And that seems because if you continue to chapter 7, Paul's going to say, okay, outside of this church, if you are two slaves and you get married, outside of this church, your marriage has no value for society. No value. You are not actually married. But here you will be. Ooh. So when you step your foot inside of our church, the way you see yourself change. The way you see others change. And by church, I'm not talking about the sanctuary, but the people. Look what Paul is creating here. Now that you are holy, you are going to live a holy life. And you're going to share this holy life with the people. The only way the church in Corinth can survive in a society marked by darkness is if they live a holy life personally and collectively as a church. So that's why when you come here, and we say, no, 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 I'm, I'm here telling the church I'm going to be baptized because I understand that that's the life God wants from me. Now, it's a calling for us to participate in that too. We don't have to go through that alone. So when Madison talks about the anxiety she was feeling, we are part of that. We participate in that as a church. Because the only way it's possible to survive, to live a holy life in a world marked by darkness and non-holiness as if we live and share this holiness together. That's why you are not called to walk alone. That's why baptism is the beginning. Guys, I want to live. I understand I'm holy because the Holy Spirit now lives in me because I accept Jesus, but now I have to live a life. I have to live a holy life. But it's difficult. The world doesn't want me to. It's a process. So if we are together... It makes everything easier. So today, when we celebrate Pentecost, we celebrate that we don't need to do something to be holy. We are holy because God lives in us. And this holiness changes the way we see each other, changes the way we behave, the way we talk, and changes how we live and interact because this holiness transforms and goes beyond the world we live in. It's eternal. The calling today, as we live in two minutes, to the rabbit lake together,
Witness, Baptist, is to say that we as a church, we understand that the only way to survive in a world marked by darkness is if we do that as a holy people. We are called to live this Pentecost, this Holy Spirit, in every day in our lives, personally, but with each other as we walk the way of Christ. This call is for me and for you today and every day. So before we go, I would like to pray with you. Shelly, Carm, Rachel, if you can do the do 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 for me. So I'm going to sing the same song we sang, and Rachel, now you can sing the whole song. I'm sorry for that. See, I just, I just want to call your attention to when Madison and uh, Violet, more specifically, they're talking about the people they talked to in church for the process of baptism. God can do that too. As with Carla, as you saw, Carla was, had a very personal thing. It's beautiful. The girls, they, 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 they were part here. They, they had something more with, the, with rage and the people in church. It doesn't matter what is your process. It's going to be personal. As Carla said, it's her and God. And how much of collectiveness is you, you're going to want in your walk with, Car, with Christ. That, that's what it means to be a church, to walk together. So when we, the girls they come in and say, no, I talked to Rachel, I talked to Pastor David, I called someone, I was in youth quake with Freddie and oh, uh, uh, in, ours in BC. So I was there and I saw them and I had people to talk to. Carla said, when I start feeling the need to be baptized, God starts sending people in my life, Christians. I was surrounded with Christians. That's part of holiness too, collective. And that's our calling today. Okay, I'm going to ask you to take 30 seconds to pray alone before we pray together. And the simple question for today is, what is, how is your holy life being lived? First, you understand that you are holy because Jesus is in you and you don't need to do anything, your own effort. And if you do, the question is, how is your holy life? Where do you need help to walk this holy life? Okay, let God speak with you. And then you're going to sing a little song before we go today.